Hello everyone and welcome to module three. This week our focus is going to be on communication, the medical office environment, and vital signs. So with that, we have three chapters that we are looking at. That's going to be chapter five, chapter six, and chapter 34. Now for this first module, Three, day one video, I'm only going to talk about chapters 6 and chapter 34. And then in the day two video, I will discuss chapter 5. So let's go ahead and get started here. So chapter 6 is dealing with the medical office environment. Now when we talk about the office environment, we really need to focus on the safety of not only ourselves but our patients as well as our coworkers, providers and other staff. Those safety measurements that we need to talk about include that of general safety, employee safety, emergency planning and handling of biohazard or biological waste and bloodborne pathogens. So in the topic of general safety we have to talk about OSHA. And if you remember from last week, we talked about how OSHA is the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. It is a governmental agency that is responsible for the safety of all employees in companies within the United States. OSHA has strict standards to help keep all employees safe. And those standards include providing training, outreach, education, establishing partnerships, encouraging continual improvement in the workplace. But OSHA is not only concerned with just bloodborne pathogens, they're also concerned with workplace hazards that could impact the employee safety. Those could be things such as fires, floods, earthquakes, hurricanes, or even explosions. Now remember, when we're dealing with fires, we have two acronyms that we use. One is called RACE, which is Rescue, Alarm, Contain, and Evacuate, and PASS. And PASS deals with using a fire extinguisher. You want to pull the pin, aim the hose at the base of the fire, squeeze the handle, and sweep side to side. Now when we talk about employee safety, it's important to know that safety is the responsibility of every staff member. Staff must be con constantly aware of their surroundings and try to avoid possible hazards when they can. Employees will also need to implement all safeguards to keep themselves safe as well as their patients. Remember, your number one priority in any situation is your patients and then yourself. When we are trying to make sure we're safe, we want to make sure that we're following the OSHA bloodborne pathogen standards. And again, we did talk about those in module two. We also want to make sure that we're following the CDC standards for universal precautions, standard precautions, and transmission based precautions. Always make sure in any situation that you are wearing your appropriate PPE. And you want to use proper body mechanics. That could be things such as making sure that you stoop and do not bend when you're bend from your back when you're picking things up. You want to bend with your legs and use your legs to pick up. You want to lift things firmly and smoothly. If you can't lift it alone, get help. Use the center of gravity for carrying a load. Don't kind of lean back because that actually causes more stress on your back and lower spine. You want to push or pull things rather than push them. Avoid reaching or twisting that can cause back pains. And you also want to make sure that you in any situation if there is an unusual event and something does happen that you are making sure that you fill out an incident report. Emergency planning is the next step. So OSHA requires that each medical office have a written exposure control plan. Again, something we talked about in module two. This helps to assist in the minimizing 
of employee exposures to infections and materials. This plan must be reviewed annually and is, again, your, your input as the medical staff is needed in order to make sure that the plan is the most up to date. Exposure control plans must consist of three parts, an exposure determination, method of compliance, and a post-exposure follow-up. Then we have handling of biological waste and bloodborne pathogens. So I want to start off with talking about handling medical and biological waste. Now those are broken down into four parts. They're either solid, chemical, radioactive, or infectious. Solid means that these items can come from the patient's room and the surgery sites. Chemical bio medical waste is substances such as germicides, cleaning supplies, and pharmaceuticals. Radioactive means that it contains a radioactive material such as iodine-123 or iodine-131. Typically those are not things that you will see in a medical clinic, um, but you do still need to be aware of them. And the last one we have is infectious, and that can be any material that has the potential to carry a disease, such as blood or other bodily fluids. Now when handling these items, regardless of their potential to carry disease, you must follow the MSDS, which is the Material Safety Data Sheet. This offers information that is needed to ensure the safety and health of the employees when storing, disposing, or handling materials. These should always be available to all employees and easily accessible. In our lab, it is found with all of the other manuals on that back corner near the artificial arms. The MSDS label can be also used. It's broken down into four categories and colors. Red stands for flammability, blue is a health hazard, yellow is for reactivity, and white stands for PPE requirements or other information. Now again, we did talk a lot about bloodborne pathogens in week two, so if you would like to review that, chapter six does a great job, but I am actually not going to talk about it in this video. If you have questions, bring them to the lab class and we can talk at that point. All right, so that's gonna wrap up chapter six. We are now gonna move to chapter 34, which is talking about your introduction to vital signs. And we will be actually performing these this week, so please make sure that you bring your equipment with you. Now, vital signs are the full responsibility of a medical assistant. They are a way to give a provider a quick snapshot of how the patient's body is functioning. And there are six main vital signs that every medical assistant is responsible for. Those are height, weight, temperature, pulse, respirations, and blood pressure. We're going to talk about each of those um, in a little bit more of a detail. So hold tight. Let's uh, start talking about those. So the first one that we're going to discuss is going to be weight. Now this is one of the first vital signs that you will take for your patients. Whenever you take a patient's weight, it should be done in a private area to make the patient feel more at ease about having this done. Nobody likes to have their weight taken, so if you can, try to do it in the exam room versus out in the open. Always make sure the patient removes their shoes or any heavy outerwear if possible. But if they refuse to either weigh or remove their shoes, just document that the patient has left their shoes on or that they have refused a weight. Whenever you document weight, it is always written in pounds. So you can see the example there. I have the patient's weight at 123 LBS. That stands for pounds. Now, whenever you take a weight, at the same time, you always take their height. In order to get an accurate and true height on your patient, you'll want to do this without their shoes on, hence why we do these two things together. Patients have to stand with their heels, buttocks, and back of their head touching the wall or the, the L bar that we have here in this picture. Okay. 
Then you'll want to place that L bar on the top of their head, not their hair, their actual head. And you want to make sure it's at a 90 degree angle. That makes sure that you are at the proper height. And whenever you are recording height, it is always in inches, not feet and inches. So if you do not know how to record those, we will talk about that this week in the lab. Temperature comes next. And the normal body temperature is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Now generally here in the United States, we always record things as Fahrenheit, but there can be some countries and states that actually write things in Celsius. So please pay attention to that. <coughs> Excuse me. There are five sites that temperature can be taken from. They can be orally, rectally, auxiliary, which is under the armpit, aorally, which is in the ear, or temporal, which is from temple to temple across the forehead. Body temperature is always lowest first thing in the morning and rises throughout the day. And there are many factors that can affect a patient's temperature. I want you to read those in your book so that way you have an understanding of them when you come to class and I will be asking that. Next we have your pulse rate. Now pulse is the number of times your heart beats per minute. The pulse is a blood wave that comes through the body when the left ventricle contracts and then relaxes. Your average adult pulse rate is somewhere between 60 and 90. And if you ever are taking somebody's pulse and it is irregular, you always wanna take that for 60 full seconds. Don't do a 30 times two or a 15 times four. If it's irregular, it's always for 30, or I'm sorry, 60 minutes. The most common place that we will take a patient's pulse is going to be at their radial artery, which is located on the thumb side of your wrist. But there are other places that you can take a pulse rate. So be prepared to come into class and talk about those. We also have respirations and we typically do pulse and respirations together because your patient should not know you're taking their respirations. If they do, what typically happens is they start to alter how they're breathing and that's not what we want. Now respirations is the act of breathing and it's a process of one inhalation and one exhalation. That is one cycle. It's not two separate things. The respiration rate indicates how well oxygen is being provided to your tissues of your body. And it, the average adult respiration rate is 12 to 20 breaths per minute. That increases for children and infants. And the last one we have to talk about is your blood pressure. Now this is actually the most important vital sign that a medical assistant will take because it helps to aid in the diagnosis and treatment of patients. Blood pressures consist of two readings, a systolic pressure, which is the highest point of pressure or the first beat that is heard, a diastolic pressure or the lowest point where your ventricles contract or the last beat that is heard. Blood pressure is always recorded as a fraction. So for example, we have 120 over 80. That is the fraction that we use to determine blood pressure. That is actually what we also consider an average blood pressure for an adult. Not a perfect, just an average. That does change with a lot of things, um, such as age, weight, gender, um, medications, things of that nature. And there are two key pieces of equipment that are needed to obtain a blood pressure. First is a stethoscope, which is what we actually use to listen to the patient for their heartbeats and a sphygmomanometer, or a blood pressure cuff. Now hopefully you all have received your blood pressure kits. If you have, please bring them to class along with a watch because those will be needed. That's all I've got for this module three day one video. Stay tuned for the module three day two video. Bye everybody and I'll see you on day one of module three.